From 3D printed basketballs to why the heck we don't share every single secret that we have. That's what we're going to talk about today. So what's up today, everybody? Um, this is another podcast episode, so we're going to go through a number of different things. We're going to start off with the Wilson basketball. Um, the Wilson basketball just came out this uh, last weekend and was kind of announced on Mondays when everybody was talking about it. Um, it's a cool thing. It's a cool thing and also like super disappointing in a number of different ways. Uh, the basketball itself, if you haven't seen it, uh, let's just run that clip. So the basketball uh, is actually made by, how do I describe this? It is an SLA printed ball. That's all it is, which makes it not really terribly interesting because it's not that hard to do. Now, the, the software that allowed it to emulate a basketball as far as bounce is impressive and interesting. Um, but what it is, what it represents and everything else just isn't, I don't care. The basketball is 3D printed with SLA. The ball itself to make something like that costs about 500 bucks for making the one prototype, which is the what it is. It is just a prototype. Wilson is not putting this into production. They couldn't. There's no way that the NBA will approve a 3D printed basketball like that for a number of different reasons that we might go into. But it's just a ball. It's fairly expensive, but it's not that expensive, which is really interesting. The ball costs 500 bucks. It could be made for like $200. And for an NBA game to have the game ball cost 200 bucks is nothing. So it, it's a cool thing. And it'd be nifty if they could apply it in more areas. But there is a reason that this was shown off in a dunking competition rather than some sort of tournament. Because in a, a dunking competition, well, you gotta grab the ball, some spherical object, and put it through the hoop. Sure, you gotta have some feel for it. I'm not gonna put down basketball players over there. Everybody in my friend group will kill me. But it, it's, not, it's not a bouncing ball. And they even say it in these statements of like, it doesn't emulate every part of the ball. We see demos of it being dribbled and that kind of thing, but it doesn't, it's not a ball. The aerodynamics of it are messed up. It looks cool. It's not a real basketball. But it is nifty that Wilson is doing it. Um, the ball itself, it was uh, created, uh, designed basically by General Lattice. They used their uh, tech to design the lattice for the interior, which is basically just a load simulation, and then it builds it out, knowing what material is. It was printed by EOS. Um, and uh, Die Mansion did the finishing to turn it black because that's all that can be done to something like that. It can't be dyed any other color. It has to be black. Um, but it, it's cool. Um, it's not practical. And quite frankly, guys, if, if there was ever an example of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, it's a basketball. There's nothing wrong with them. There's no real improvement that can be made from 3D printing it except to make the thing more expensive. Um, even if, well, the printing could make it as affordably as anything else. If Wilson wanted to get a bunch of MJF machines and knock these out, they could be $50 balls like any other basketball. But uh, it's just, it, it doesn't matter because the basketball is fine. Everybody knows how to use them. No one has to re-get the touch for the basketball. People don't like glow-in-the-dark basketballs for heaven's sakes. There is no reason a 3D printed basketball matters. Now, to be fair, this was just a marketing stunt. It's not going into production. It's not going to be used. And as a basketball fan, I don't want to watch one of those balls. So it, it cool, great, good for Wilson for innovating and getting into 3D printing. And that is significant. They're a big company. Um, but I don't care. Um, yay. It looks cool. It has no real validity whatsoever in any sort of context. Um, and I wish I wasn't that negative about it. But I, I don't care. It's not that big of a deal. Um, next piece of news. Um, General Atomics has signed a partnership with Divergent. So uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, General Atomics, if you don't know, is an aircraft manufacturer, for lack of a better word. They're best known for uh, making uh, the Predator drones. Um, but in working with Divergent, what General Atomics is wanting to do is create uh, 3D printed drones that can be dropped in and built kind of in the location which is a really neat uh, kind of application for it all. Uh, seeking cheaper, faster production of its unmanned vehicles, General Atomics plans to announce this week a new agreement with commercial automotive 3D printing firm Divergent Technologies. It's weird um, that uh, Divergent is going this direction because they must not be making enough cars. 
Um, the company has raised roughly $700 million through Series D funding. Um, it's not known in defense circles. All of this I'm quoting from an article in Breaking Defense. Um, it's an interesting pairing, but not unreasonable. A 3D printed aircraft is a great application because aircraft, just from the design standpoint, are very manufacturable with additive. Um, so that's fine. Um, it's kind of a weird partnership between a supercar company and General Atomics. But you know what? When somebody wants something made and you can make it, go ahead and make it. Who cares? Um, let's see here. Are there any like key advantages? They, they don't talk about any big details. Um, part of this technology stack and 15 fastest state-of-the-art machine. The company at claims the company, uh, Zinger, who uh, cites nearly 550 patents, um, says the company's production is 15 to 30 times faster than the fastest state-of-the-art machine. This is interesting. I don't know what his state-of-the-art machine is for printing drones, um, but the big benefit of this, uh, printed in any sort of aerospace context, is part consolidation. Being able to print a drone that is just a full body with every bracket and mount and everything else integrated into it. So all you have to do is shove a motor and a chip into it and then the thing is flying. So 3D printed aircraft is wildly underutilized and that part consolidation ca capability is wildly underutilized industry in every industry all over the place. Um, but aerospace has the money to pay for it and really pursue it in a way to learn the DFAM that's necessary for that. Um, so good, um, getting some more mainstream use of that kind of stuff. Next topic, Horizon Air using <laughs> 780 3D printed parts. Horizon Aircraft is an electric VTOL. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't want to go deep into this one. I don't, it, every aircraft has 3D printed parts in it. This is not news. This is par for the course. If an aircraft doesn't use 3D printed parts, they are wildly behind technologically because there's so many weight and structural advantages to using 3D printed parts that to not do that would be silly. Um, and it's an electric VTOL, who cares? Uh, it looks like they're printing the propellers, which is nifty. Um, and yeah, it looks like, uh, I believe Horizon has only done a small prototype and that's the main thing that's been printed. So it's not even like the production aircraft. So yeah, they are printing the propellers, which is cool, but again, not really that new. So. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like this negative. And I think actually I'm seeing the next article coming up and I think it's gonna get worse, but I must be in a mood of some sort today because uh, the next article is Slice Engineering and Infinity 3D Printing Partner. Um, it's not a partnership, it's a general business good partnership that happens every day. It's a contract. Uh, it looks like Slice Engineering is going to make extruders for Infinity 3D Printing. Uh, Infinity is a Taiwanese company that makes 3D printers and they want to use the slight slicer or the, uh, the slice engineering hot end. Great, awesome, fantastic. Guys, here's the thing. The 3D printing industry, I understand that on this channel and through my various channels, I'm very bullish about 3D printing and very excited about what it can do and think that it is wildly underutilized today. And I'm going to continue with that and say that we have to get more excited. This is ridiculous because the idea that a hot end manufacturer is putting a hot end into a 3D printing company's 3D printer, that that is news. Who cares? Of course it's happening. Why wouldn't it happen? That who? Yeah, good for them. Great for slice engineering. They make great hot ends. But that's not fixing the world. It is not replacing injection molding. It is not moving 3D printing into new categories and new capabilities and making it do the stuff that it can be have done with it. So apologies for being negative, but let's do something interesting. Please, guys, comment down below. Guys, here's the thing. We, we curate these podcasts. Please comment down below with topics that you think are fantastically cool. Um, these articles today, I think, are kind of general. Um, I, I think... When we put together this podcast, the reason we don't do this every week um, is because there is not enough news in the 3D printing industry to talk about every week. We're on every other week, and the one thing we've got is the Wilson basketball, which is cool, fine, dandy, don't care. I wouldn't give it as much time as we probably should. Um, so I'm a comment with other co topics, please. Other things you'd like us to cover in this that are 
more common and everybody within the industry get on your horse come on we got cooler stuff going on build something cool um get people excited yes i understand that 3d printing was overhyped in 2012. it's not overhyped right now it's wildly underhyped for what 3d printing is capable of doing today and people the the industry itself needs to get off its own back because it's just ridiculous anyhow next topic um small story yep yeah. um no nah, i just kind of covered that one small stories for a small industry there is no people project that 3d printing will be a hundred billion dollar market by 2030. that's ridiculous that's about the same size or smaller than cnc machining there is no reason that 3d printing should not be enormous 3d printing makes plastic parts there's two trillion dollars of plastic stuff made every year well yeah, well, $1.6 to $2 trillion of plastic stuff. Big part of that is packaging, but most of it is just the soles of your shoes and everything else. And they can all be mass produced with printing today. And people just don't do it. So anyhow, um, reactions to the print farm video. Okay, why, why are we such greedy, <laughs> greedy misers? Um, so, Earlier last week, or last week on Saturday, we released a video about print farms and the challenges of print farms. And there were uh, comments in it where they, there were requests for us to share more information about our print farm, which were, we share a lot. We're not gonna share everything. I'm, I'm sorry, we, we've spent too many years learning the hard lessons. But it also wouldn't be useful. First of all, our, the, this channel is to highlight 3D printed products and how to mass produce stuff with 3D printing. That is the point of this channel. It is not to teach people how to 3D print, even though we cover that. All of our, our design videos and that kind of thing are intended to show somebody making a product how to optimize it for manufacturing. It is not to show somebody with a 3D printer how to get a better 3D printed part. That's a, that's a side effect. Um, that we're happy to contribute, but that's not the main intention of it. Um, we don't want to teach people how to build print farms. It, that's not the goal because all I'll say right now that all of the rules have already been written because a print farm is not a new piece of technology. A print farm is an exercise in implementation. The amount of effort that you Building a print farm is the exact same as building any sort of factory, whether it be CNC machines or injection molding machines or anything else. It, the, the machines on the shelves are just a component of a much bigger system. There is no possible way that we can explain how to build that system because number one, we haven't perfected it ourselves yet, but we follow the same rules and guidelines as anybody building a factory. We lay it out, we build, we follow lean principles, all that kind of stuff. Um, we follow the different certifications that exist inside the world and we do everything that everybody else who's in traditional manufacturing does. So there's not new information in that regard. How to build a factory is a fairly well-defined setup Unless you're looking at Tesla, then they're doing all kinds of things differently. Um, and 3D printing kind of aids that, but different topic. Anyway, um, we're teaching how to build a print farm right now is irrelevant because it's still evolving. And yes, we have created some really awesome stuff. And no, we don't want to share it around because we are competing with China and with other people building print farms and that kind of thing. So there is no reason to make what is already a difficult task harder by giving everything that we've learned away. Um, if the, the benefits of the farm come from the ability of it to be invisible, not from sharing or selling the machines. We stopped selling machines years ago because it's just, it wasn't useful for our goals of trying to make it possible for a kid in a dorm room to get access to a print farm that was scalable and large the same way we could access server farms when we were building websites back when we were younger. Um, so the, the point of the print farm is to be a piece of infrastructure, not a product to sell. What it produces, the stuff it outputs, is the thing that is being sold by the people who create those things. We want to be able to enable people to create those things because printing has always had a very huge scalability problem. It's always had a very big reliability problem. 
And we pursue it as if we build this print farm, then it builds a freeway that other people can race cars down. Um, so no, we're not going to share everything because it's irrelevant because building a factory is building a factory. And what we do share, we do shall share many of our basic principles and problem solving issues of like, what makes a good mass production printer? Why do off the shelf printers not work? Why are bed slingers stupid? All of these things are topics that we have covered and you can listen to us or not. The information is out there. Um, but no, we're not gonna tell you exactly the tolerances and designs of certain things that we've created because that would, took very a lot of engineering effort and experience to get to that. And we'd like to let it bear fruit for a moment. That being said, we haven't patented much because number one, trade secrets are more powerful and the rate of innovation is what protects us in this. 3D printing is moving very quickly and evolving all the time. Um, so getting a patent is a waste of resources and effort. And since they can only be enforced by fighting somebody, I, I don't wanna go fight anybody right now. So we're not pursuing that kind of strategy. So we create what we create and then we move on to the next thing and create a better version of it. And as things kind of grow along, we'll show you the reasons that we came to where we are and try to show more details, but there is no reason to give up the secret recipe, um, especially when it's still kind of half-baked because we're still learning how to build print farms. Factories are set. Um, the technology is fairly proven out, but how to do it is a tougher problem that we're even still working through. Um, we had a major restructuring last year but anyhow, no, we're not going to explain every single detail. We, we show great amounts of what we do and how we do it here, um, but we're not going to show everything. We're not going to lift the dress completely because we don't know each other that well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was just kind of the reaction to that. That print farm video was met, intended just to show people who are thinking about building a print farm why it can be so miserable um, if you're not set up for it because it's... you're. Print, putting machines on the shelf is not the hard part. Uh, paying for the batch of machines on the shelf is not the hard part. It is everything around it. It is the system design. Because when you build a print farm, you are not don't have a bunch of machines over there and parts fall out. You build a print farm and you have built a machine that you are now inside of. And if you're part of that and you want to be out of that machine as much as possible, which is why we use robots and that kind of thing. So the, the no, we're, uh, the, the print farm video, print farms are horrible. I mean, it's not fun, but we've spent five years perfecting machines that are low maintenance, high reliability, uh, and are able to build the next few thousand machines that we build. Um, and we're not gonna immediately give off that design for some desktop machine manufacturer to utilize. Um, not that they would, because the, the goals for a desktop machine and the goals of a production machine are completely different, so it's not that useful. Um, but still, print farms will become increasingly common, um, and there's no reason for us to give up all of these hard-learned lessons. Because when we think about like competition, say Amazon wants to compete with Slant 3D someday. Um, they have billions of dollars to sling around. In manufacturing, billions of dollars does not buy experience or expertise. And since manufacturing is really slow to iterate on um, compared to something like software, money can't buy speed. So we have this large span of experience that we've built up over years that you can't really get any other way than just slogging through it yourself. Um, and we're not gonna release that information so that everybody else gets to shortcut right to the end to our level of experience. Um, because it's dangerous as the company continues to grow. Um, and I want to make sure that my team is employed into the future. So, no, we're not going to give up every secret. Um, you're, you're welcome to learn it yourself, and we share as much as we can. Um, so we can't give it all up. But anyhow, um, we're not patenting it. We won't stop anybody else from going and running with something if they've got it there. But they're, no. <laughs> But that's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening if you made it this far. Uh, like I said, comment down below with other topics or cool cool things in 3D printing that gets you excited about what the industry is able to do. Um, we're going to continue to do this kind of podcast version, version of the show intermittently as we kind of feel like it and find cool things to talk about. Um, but other than that, we always publish on Tuesday and Saturday. Have a great day, everybody.